Hey, my name is Pastor Sunil, and welcome to our archive messages. You can join us on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. in person, or catch us live online. We hope that you're truly blessed by this message, and once again, thanks for tuning in. This morning's message, you know, you talk about, there's one subject, and I'm probably, I'm preaching a controversial message this morning. And there's probably one subject that gets people's feathers ruffled, ruffled talking about turkeys. You think maybe it's the subject of sin? I've preached on that. That's not the most one that gets most people ruffled. It's not the second coming of Jesus. It's not even the topic of hell. It's a topic of money. That kind of makes us kind of have the creepies usually when we start talking about that. Today we're talking about giving. Now typically when, I shouldn't say typically, but I, I need to admit that historically, often you recall a message of giving as associated with a particular building fund drive or a new church or a, a church building or a, a campaign of some sort. And sometimes that's when we talk about it, and unfortunately then it doesn't get talked about, it's not in a Bible study, it's not mentioned hardly ever again until the next time we have a big need or a campaign that's got to have funding. Now I understand all those things, I, 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 believe me, I get it, and, but, but I'm just trying to state the fact, that's generally when we would get a sermon on giving. Thank you very much. You want to make sure I gave, I see that, thank you. Oh, and even a... I did ask for this for an illustration for my sermon... Uh, and that I'm going to get to a little bit later. I, I did not expect the happy face. In, uh... <laughs> so this is the ushers pulling a prank. The joy of giving right there in your offering plate. But uh, I'll more of that a little bit later. Crazy people. I thought it was just the staff that were all trickling down, I see. You know, you're talking about, and now before you tune me out, okay? Before you tune me out, hear me out. And let me just say transparently this morning, there is, there is nothing more humbling in doing what I do than the reality of the fact that I receive a paycheck because people give. That's a really humbling thing. It's, it's, it's something that I don't forget. I never forget. There is not a time when I receive a paycheck that I don't think of the fact that I receive because people give to the work of the Lord. It, it, it guides not only how I live my personal life and how I give, but it guides and, and totally is directly related to how I approach finances as the pastor of this church. I never forget that. And so even talking about this today is, is difficult in some ways because I recognize that, that many of you give. And give the way God asks you to give. So why would I preach on this? Well, I'm preaching on it, A, because I went ahead and started a series in Malachi, and here it is. We didn't skip the difficult verses when it says, uh, talks about relationships and unfaithful relationships. We didn't talk about the difficult verses when it talks about God is not changing us, so we need to repent. And I'm not going to skip this verse either. The truth of the matter is, God has a lot to say about money, a lot to say about wealth, a lot to say about stewardship, investment, possessions. In the Old Testament and New Testament combined, there's about 800 references. This is not minor, this is major. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, 25% of the time Jesus is talking, he's talking about money. In 17 out of the 36 parables where he did most of his teaching, the way he taught, half of the parables almost were about time. Not just time, tithe, money, possessions, stewardship. Why? Because as Jesus said, where your treasure is, your heart is. It's an indicator of your love. More people have worshipped money than probably any other idol or god ever in existence. Why does this strike a nerve? Well, it's kind of not surprising, huh? In fact, money touches probably, nothing touches your life more than money except God himself. I mean, currency in every 
society in every country. It's universal. But as a believer in Christ, as a Christian, as a church, we are not to be concerned with whether we have or don't have money. That should not be our primary concern. As a believer, I need to be more concerned with who I am, who God is, and what that might mean for what I do with my money. See, that's the most important thing. Today, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to start in our text, and then I'm going to finish and cap it off with an application from the New Testament, and then a direct application with us today. The biblical record, the way the Bible approaches finances and possessions and money is what we're looking for today. We're looking for answers from God's Word. We're not just punching in money, possessions, or tithe in Google and then just taking whatever it spits out at us. We're going to look at what the Bible, what the biblical record is. Everything I do and think about money needs to be framed in the grid, in the parameters of who is God. What does it mean for who I am? What do I do with what I have? Paul talks to Timothy, and he's talking about leaders, and he's saying leaders need to not be known as people who are lovers of money. Well, that's interesting, eh? Hebrews also says, God will never leave us or forsake us and links the love of money with the lack of understanding of that. Here's the zinger. I don't know why I got... I literally put in my notes, zinger. Usually I, sometimes I'll put like illustration or APPL, which means application if I'm trying to hit home something. This one I just put zinger. I tweeted the zinger this week and put it on Facebook. If we love God, we will use money. But if we love money, we will use God to get more money. The question is goal or greed. Now, let me speak to this right off the top because here's why I have a hesitation sometimes to speak about money. Because whenever you talk about money or finances, immediately people think you're talking about prosperity gospel. I do not prescribe to the prosperity gospel. I'm not talking about the prosperity gospel. Some of you want to know what that is? That's the name it, claim it. You want a Cadillac, you ask for a Cadillac, and you tell them the kind of Cadillac you want. That's what, not what I'm talking about. You know, the prosperity gospel is kind of like this. I mean, they'll go to text like I'm going to right now. And just because someone else went to this text and talked about something as crazy as the prosperity gospel doesn't mean that that's what I'm talking about when I come to it. I believe that God said what he said in the word that we're looking at today. I just don't believe that everybody has said about what God said in this word. This prosperity gospel, you know how it talks about. It says, you know, talk about the tithe. We're talking a little bit later. And, and they say, you know, God is this great big pinata in heaven, basically. It's full of all kinds of luscious candy. And the problem is, is, is you're not tithing. And if you tithe, then all of this candy would come falling down from heaven on top of you. And you would have more candy than you know what to do with. But the problem is you're not tithing. So what you need to do is you need to get the tithe, which is the great big pinata stick. And if you hit the pinata with this stick, tithe, then boom, it's going to come down. And everybody thinks that's just how it happens. I just got to hit, wham, hit it, down comes the tithe, and I get everything that's coming to me. No. It's almost like a, some kind of a crazy celestial Ponzi scheme. Pull in a little bit and you get tons back. Ah, that's not what this is. God has a conversation with his people about money and that's why I think we need to have a conversation about money. And eventually I hope that you go home this week and then you have a conversation with God about money. Tracking, though, where we are in Malachi, God's having a conversation. We see the, uh, the father's chair. He's sitting in the chair, and he wants to talk to his children. And now it's like the father-children talk about finances. The straying children and a loving father. Remember, God was saying, I don't change. You're far from me. I'm right here. Come to me, and I'll be right here. Moves from the theoretical to a practical Remember they having a bunch of accusations and arguing with them, thinking, we're, not, we're pretty good. How have we done so wrong? We're not as bad as you say. Who are you to judge? You don't understand. Times are tough. God moves into the practical and then to the financial. 
He said, I'm going to give you some specific examples if you want some. Let's start with pulling up your budget. They're going to have a budget meeting with God. How many are glad I didn't stay to say, everybody bring their budgets this morning to church. We're going to have a budget meeting. and We're going to put it up on the screen. I mean, I'm glad we're not doing that today. That would be a little bit scary for some of us. Now, again, I do think you should have a budget meeting with God. I think that would be a great thing, great follow-through from the message this morning. Sit down in the presence of God and say, okay, God, here's what I got. Here's what I have. Before you do that, though, you need to also say, here's what I have, here's what you've given me. You see, because God is the owner of all things and we are just the stewards. Now, if we're going to go any farther with this biblical record and the biblical guideline, if you want to follow God's way, you must have this as your ultimate premise. And that is, God is the owner of all things. You are just a steward. You have to have that as a conviction. If you don't, most of this will not make sense to you. You have to know and believe that God is the owner of all things. You and I, don't own anything. I remember when the kids were younger, I would go, uh, and, and how's their processing things? You, everything you own, you have a key to. You know what's that? You have the keys to the car, keys to the house. So naturally, when I would get my church keys, the kids would think, you own the church? I says, no. no I have, you have a key to the church? Yes. Yes, I, I do have a key to the church. You spend a lot of time at the church. Yes, I do spend a lot of time at the church. You own the church. No, I don't own the church. I do not own the church. Just because you have a key to something doesn't make you the owner. God owns your house. God owns your car. God owns every possession you have, your money, your bank account. It belongs to God. You are the steward of those resources. The earth is the Lord, Psalm says, everything in it, the world, and all who live in it. Listen what Jesus said about stewardship. Whoever can be trusted with very little can be also trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with something, some someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. There seems to be a power in money. All this is interest. I'm interest. Intro. Interest. See the money thing? My mind was going crazy there. All this is intro, and I'm going to be trying to go as fast as I can. I've written most of the principles down ahead of you, and I'll try to get through this. I spent about four weeks in putting this message together. Every time I do another message, I kept pieces of this kept coming to my mind. Power and money. It seems like the more you get it, the harder time you have of letting go of it to God or to anyone. Sinful nature has a hard time (coughs) giving to God. It's an old story. God takes serious the use of what we have. Worship includes giving of our substance. Now let's read our text. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Remember he said, uh, return to me and I'll return to you. Comes in just to this section of scripture now. He says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe to the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields and will not drop their fruit before that's ripe, says the Lord. And all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Financial confrontation. God accuses his people of robbery. Begins with an indictment. You're stealing from me. You're withholding. You're holding back. You're cooking the books. You're not giving. 
what you're supposed to give. Okay, this thing about tithe. T-I-T-H-E. Notice I'm wearing a tithe. This mo- no, I said, I said to Pam, should I, should I wear a tithe this morning, Pam? Pam goes, yeah, you can. I was just, it's a crazy thing, but I had to make myself some humor coming up to a difficult t- subject. So, God's requesting people to give to the Levites a tithe. Now, from the very beginning, we know that there was a sacrifice required from God, Cain and Abel, and there was a fight about that one way back when. That God has always had expectations in worship, and in, in, in the New Testament, it is no different than the Old Testament. There's expectation. We'll get that in a few moments. But in this case, the tithe particularly, yes, is an Old Testament law concept tax. People would, all of Israelites, would come and give to the work of God in the tabernacle. They would give it to the Levites, those who were in charge of ministering the work of God in the tabernacle. Requirement of all Israelites, 10%, tithe. Of all they had earned, crops, animals. Now, what's interesting also is Aaron and the priests, they would receive from what came in a portion and, the, and, and to have sustenance for themselves, but from what they received, they also, in numbers we see, had to also give a tithe. Now you think, now, why don't you just take 9% rather than like take 10%? I mean, they take their amount and then they have to give back tithes? Like, why don't you just deduct the difference and take the net? Why? Because there is something important about giving the tithe. That even those that received from the tithe, they were in charge of giving the tithe. There was also a concept of first fruits. They gave the best of their crops in the beginning. Stealing. I mean, it's one thing to steal from a man or a woman. But it's another whole thing to steal from God. Have you ever had something stolen? Who's had something stolen? Let me see your hand. Who's been robbed? Let me see it up real high. Yeah, it's like everybody's almost been robbed. It is one of the worst feelings ever. Right? I mean, you just feel like, you know, your emotions just get, I remember people broke into our house more than once. My brother came home to some guys in the house when he saw them moving when the cars went into the one window. Freaked us out. Every room you're going in, you think someone was in this room, someone was in this room. I remember they, they took our, I mean, we didn't have a lot of stuff, but we finally got a VHS. <laughs> they took the VHS with the movie still in it. We lost our VHS and the movie. They also took our boombox. Remember what a boombox is, Dave? And we had a boombox. Some guys are like, what a boombox? We had a boombox. They took our Sony Walkman. Yeah. I mean, those big things that had, you know. And it was the one that had the clamp on it. We replaced those things. Insurance helped us. They're deductible and stuff. But still... Man, I, have, I was pickpocketed once. You want to know where I was pickpocketed? I was pickpocketed in Rome. I was pickpocketed in Rome in the Pope's house. I was going through like everybody else. Well, not in his house, but you know what I'm saying. I, I'm going through. We're looking at all the art. We're jammed in. Yeah. Here I am, St. Peter's Basilica, and whew. I didn't check and see if that was just an involuntary offering or if it was someone else that was a, a worshiper that had come and steal. I'm not sure how that, imagine that one say, um, you don't have to give today. We just got, uh, we've placed some pickpocketers in the church this morning and they will just, uh, they'll make sure you give this morning. You don't have to worry about it. We'll take care of that for you. Stealing is a very common sin. One of the most common reasons why people are in jail is because of stealing. Various degrees. Children steal. We don't have to teach them to steal. We need to have to teach them why it's wrong. You see, outside of God, people might not think that giving is that important, or even especially giving to God. Why is it important? Well, because it recognizes our submission to God. It recognizes that all we have is His. It recognizes that we are humble and He is great. It prevents us from worshiping things when we know that we don't hold on to them too tightly. We learn to give of our material so we can be able to also learn to give of what's immaterial, things like our soul, our future, and our dreams. Israel didn't like God withholding 
his blessings, but they were withholding their giving from him. It's kind of ironic. They didn't feel like they're robbing from God. God said, I think you're robbing from me. They said, we don't think we're robbing you. And then you have this disagreement. How have we robbed God, they say. Same time when they're angry with God about not blessing us. It's you that are robbing us of our blessing. God goes, no, you are robbing me. And we've got an argument. God's saying this. Here's the situation. I made the earth and everything in it, and I gave you this. They're an agrarian society, an agricultural society. They are planting, there's rain, there's sun, there's growth, there's harvest. And it's easy for us to think that my effort on my plot of land has given me my crops. And God goes, no, that is my land, that's my sun, and that's my rain. And you're getting fruit, and it's my fruit. Think here of a business, generate, a business illustration. I'm not sure, I mean, how many here of... Uh, you own your own business, or you run a business, you're resulting, you have to manage perhaps a business. Think of investments. There's an owner, a part owner. God is saying, I am part owner in what you're doing. I am owner. This is where we are in Malachi 3. He says, I got a deal. I'll give you the land, I'll give you the water, I'll give you the sun. You just give me 10% of what comes out of that. Now, that's a pretty good deal. I mean, 10%, 50-50 is usually what things are. You know, we'll divide them up. He just said, give me 10%. And then after that, you don't even give that 10%. It's, think of it as like mining. Someone has a stake of a claim. And we have this oftentimes, the northwest part of Canada you have the gold mines, and people will have, you've seen those TV shows, you know, where they're mining, and they're, they're pretty actually kind of neat. I mean, it's kind of a cool, uh, watch them, they buy this one section, and they're sh- shooing people off, and everyone's got guns and makes sure they're defending their claim. But uh, they can actually rent out the claim and have someone else work the claim for them as long as they get an agreement of how much, if you find something, recognizing it's my claim, you have to give me some. Imagine if you had the deal. You go dig it. It's my claim. I own it. I paid for it. I have the deed for it. You can work it. But if you find something, you've got to give me 10% of anything you find. Deal. Done. They go. They find. But they don't give the 10 They go and they spend the whole 100 Okay. Maybe that's hard. You're thinking... I don't have a farm. I'm not a miner. Okay, so maybe you're in sales and you've worked out an agreement with your boss and it says, okay, I'll work for commission. Can you imagine if it was flipped the other way? You work for commission. Everything you get, all the money comes into the business. The business will give you 10% of your sales. Imagine if they did that. It all comes in. Great, I'll do it. I'll, I can sell so much. That's going to be okay. You go out, you sell everything you can. You give it your all. And the business keeps everything. What would you do? You come knocking in on your boss's door and you say, wait a minute, you're robbing me. You're stealing. We had an agreement and this is not it. Well, we gave you something, didn't we? Yes, but this is not what we agreed. It doesn't balance. Okay, so you got enough to realize how there's this disagreement between partners. We had a deal. The problem is they did not see their income, their business, their portfolio, their wealth, their crops as God's. They saw it as theirs. Here's the consequences. Israel discovered that by holding back from God, they were declining, not gaining. Isn't that interesting? When you read that, you see things aren't going great. They're holding back. They should have more. They have less. In fact, the Bible uses the word cursed. they had chosen to disobey Now, this is hard to realize, but in some ways, if you put it in the context of the prodigal, it actually makes kind of sense. Can you imagine sitting, the father sitting in his chair, and and his kids are calling him up on FaceTime and saying, you don't love us. What do you mean I don't love you? I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. You don't love us. If you loved us so much, how come it, we last night, we are totally rained on it, poured rain, and we're soaking wet. You're not even protecting us from the elements. We were robbed two days ago. What did you do about that? Nothing. I'm starving. I haven't meal in three days. You haven't even fed us. 
The father says, listen, I have a table. I have a house. Your room is still the same place it was in the upper side of the, of the house. It's yours, ready for you. But you ran away. You ran away. Why are we so ready to blame God for not protecting and not providing when it's us the ones that ran away? Is it surprising that their life is, is not under the blessing of God when they've run from the Father's house? Don't expect provision and protection when you run away. The good news is, the father doesn't lock the door when you get out and say, and don't come back. The opposite. He says, come back. Whenever you want to come back, that door is open. In fact, my arms are open wide. That's what the father says. To steal from God was one of the worst choices. Not only did they not gain... They lost. This is kingdom accounting. Now this is where some of us might blow a gasket. But it is a biblical truth. Christ teaches this. If you want to gain something, you need to. You need to lose it. And if you, if you lose something, you will. Now that doesn't make sense. You try to sell that to your accountant. You sit in front, of the, in front of the banker and try to explain that type of accounting. That doesn't, you know why? Because that's kingdom accounting. That's kingdom accounting. Dave, we were talking about that. You gave me that phrase this week. Okay, I'm used to picking on Dave's. I got, I'm, I'm covered by Dave's here on both sides. But. Kingdom accounting. You want something, you got you to let it go. You hold on to it, you lose it. Financial challenge. Trust. We can put our confidence in God or money, but not both. God offers them a solution. The solution is in the form of a challenge. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me on this, he says. The challenge was not about increment. It was about, listen, I want to put a challenge. You try this and see. Now more on the tithe, this income tax system. They were always in the plural. Just in some of you. This might be new for some of you. You'll be glad. When I say this, you'll be glad I'm not pushing tithing. Now, hear me out, though. But you'll be glad when you hear this. Because there's more than one tithe. There was, you would give 10% each year, per year, for two years. And then the additional tithe of 10%, making it 30% for that year. There was more than one tithe. I'm not sure if my math is right, but it's up and around like over the 20 three and the third percent kind of thing. There's more than just one tithe. In fact, the last tithe was specifically for those who were poor in the land and needy. The point is this. There's more than one tithe, and the tithe was something that was a set, and we'll get those principles in a few moments. But the tithes were something that would actually, people would give from the very beginning of the best, and it was connected with their trust and their faith in God. They trusted God to take care of them. It's not surprising then when they, if they felt like God wasn't taking care of them that they did not then tithe. And it wasn't just the money thing for God. God doesn't need our money. It was more about the fact of the lack of trust that was the issue. When having becomes dominant and money is worshipped, then we slip into greed. And what Thomas Aquinas says, the immoderate love of possessing Ironic, the, those who have more tend to trust less. Those who have little tend to trust more. It's true, isn't it? It's always been the case. The widow's might, I'm going to refer to that in a few moments, gave what she had. Test God in this. Why does he say test? Well, because either it works or it doesn't work. A church member was having trouble with the concept of tithing, and I was listening to one pastor's response. It was quite interesting. The pastor... And why, you can see why in a few moments why it jumped out at me. He said, uh, the person came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I just can't give um, a tithe. I can't give 10%. And so, uh, on top of all our bills and everything else, I just can't do it. So the pastor said this, I believe it's true. How about we do a challenge? I'll give you a test. You tithe for the next two months. And if your bills fall short, 
I'll make up the difference. Now, now you see why this jumped out at me. I'm thinking, woof. I wouldn't even dare to think about what that could, implication of me would be that for this whole church. I mean, that would be tough. What do you say? Sure. If you promise to make up any shortage, I guess I can try tithing for a couple of months. What did the pastor say? So now what do you think of that? Huh. So you're going to try this just on my word. You'll put your trust in me. But you won't put your trust in God who says, try it. Put your trust in me. I like that illustration, although I'm not going to follow that illustration. <laughs> I don't even know what the end result of that was, but it's interesting. It's about trust for God. Here's the problem. They clearly, it seemed, they wanted to have God to bless them first, and then they would trust God and give to him out of what he gave. But God goes, it doesn't work that way. You don't. I don't just bless you and then you honor me. He says, first you honor me, then I will bless you. Why is it in that way? Well, I, I think the, yes, the idea is here, the blessings come down from heaven. He blessed first, they would think that all of what they have comes from their business, from the ground up from what they've done, from their strength and their arm. There's a biblical record of this in Deuteronomy where he specifically says, be very careful to honor God when you do well so you don't think that your strength has done it. God says, no, no, no. Blessings don't come from the creation up. Blessings come from the creator down. Every good, perfect gift comes from above, from our Heavenly Father. Blessings come down, not up. Back to the contemporary business illustration. God is saying, I've invested in this company and I don't think you're responding rightly with my investment. So until you change your ways, I am not investing anymore. Now, it's quite clear. What could they expect as a nation? It says the windows of heaven were open. I remember singing that song years ago, the windows of heaven are open, floodgates are... I mean, it was kind of cool in Bible college, we'd sing it, we'd give her... It's interesting. It's almost like insider trading. He says, you have someone they can't lose. If you do this, windows of heaven will open. Telling. 11 and 12 of Malachi chapter 3, and then we're going to move to some practical and be done. Results of their faithfulness would be obvious to them and to everybody else. God would honor his side of things. Other nations would prove to be amazed. God's principles... Period. All of them. Not only the ones regarding money, everything. God's principles are observable and testable. God's laws are observable and testable. When you follow God's ways, it is tangible. It goes for individuals, for institutions, for nations. Isn't it interesting that even the mood will change? It says that it will be delightful land. Delight, joy in giving. Now, I have not experienced joy in giving even close to the, what I witnessed when I was in Africa. It's like every time I'm there, if I'm there for an offering. But one particular time, one is the first time I remember experiencing it. <clears throat> Overwhelmed by the culture shock of how much what looked to be poverty around me, what later I describe as a lack of possessions. I can't call it poverty. For the people I saw that were worshiping, they did not think that they were lacking. They were in the service, the mud hut church, half cut logs flipped over, jammed in there. You'd see them come to church, it's incredible how clean their clothes are when they came to church. And when you knew, especially from where they came. This last time I went with my father, I was preaching. My father was preaching at the largest church in Nairobi. And I was preaching in this little church closest to the second largest slum in the world called Kibera. You want to look online? K-I-B-E-R-A. It is. It is. It, gobsmacking for Pastor Call and British people that are here today. It is unbelievable. You look at it, it's just like, whoa. 
He's just tin shacks everywhere. There is a little church ministering there. A lot of them among this one is just outside of Cabrera. People come out of Cabrera where, where the gutters are literally just flowing just with sewage all over the place. And people, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. But uh, there's, they don't know how many exactly. Between, there are estimates between 800 to, uh, sorry, 500 to 800,000 people live in just over a square mile. There's a little church they pass, they're singing. Got the time of the offering, man. Offering is like the highlight of the service. They get those drums, they hit them harder than they've ever hit them. People come down and, and they, have, they have a big bin. There, it's a laundry basket. And they've got on the front ties. And the one here, laundry basket offerings. And then they have another one, small one here, alms for the poor. These people that live in the slum of Cabrera come and give to people who are poor. I'm standing here. I mean, it's just hitting me. I'm just like, man, do they come begrudgingly? No. They don't even have to be, they don't even beg to come. It's a part of the service where, I mean, they, Jesus, you're giving her, they're singing top of the lungs. They are dancing and twirling, coming down. I'm not kidding you. Dance is a big part of the culture. They're coming down, giving, giving in this one, giving in that one, giving in this one. I mean, it's a whole thing. It lasts like 15, 20 minutes. Everybody coming, going back, back to the seat, singing a song, dancing. Then they're finished. Then they bring up another mother. And, and she's come from away. She's a single mother. I don't even know. I was trying to figure it out in Swahili when I was here. And the reason I was in this church is because I spoke more Swahili than my dad. And so I got the Swahili church and he got the English one. Um, but, uh, and, and I wasn't complaining. It was, I was right at home. After they come down, they have her come up. Sister had a need. I don't know what it was, but sister had a need. Come again. They just start coming. Come and give a, give a gift to sister. And, and sister be standing there, and they just come and give a gift to sister. And then one lady in the church comes up and picks up a chicken. Here you go, sister. Here's a chicken. Just give it to the sister. Raising her kids. She goes and sits down, tears in her eyes. Church being the church. I have never seen joy in giving like I saw there. You know, at the end of that service, I've never forgotten it. I meant to bring it today, but I didn't. At the end of that service, they took an up an offering for the preacher. For me. I told the mama beside me, I said, Apana, no, 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 no. She said, she looked at me. She's this big mama. She said to me, why would you stop us from blessing you? I said, no, no, I did not come here to receive an offer. I'm just here to bless you. You did bless us. And we're going to bless you. No, 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 you're not going to. She looked at us. She said, we are going to bless you. <laughs> so I sat there and watched these people that have already gave twice. Receive an offering. There's another pastor in the, in the congregation. It was just about... 50 people, 60 people. They called that pastor forward. They did another offering for the preachers. The bills I received, you could barely see the numbers on them. Totaled about $9 and a lot of different change. The mama didn't want to give me small change, so they, right there in front of everybody, they were, at the, they were singing another song. And they were sorting it out and put it in piles with the treasurer and the mama and another leader. And then they presented me a blessing. I was, I said, I can't take that. She said, you will take it. I, I, it was amazing how joyful they were in giving. And for me to not receive that would rob them of joy, the way she saw it. I remember holding, I mean, I had other cash with me. I gave in the offering earlier. But I kept that cash. Because of what it reminded me of. 
Here's the truth. God will always do a better job of blessing you than you can do at blessing you. There was a little boy back when they used to have, do you remember the candy store? We had a candy store near where we would be in the summertime as little kids. The name is Don Sly. Don Sly owned this as campground kind of area, some cottages. And he had this little, little candy store, you know, um, black balls, uh, the, the pink popcorn, you know, the pink popcorn, uh, the elephant popcorn, and uh, licorice, some of these little, and these, the, I remember he used to have the uh, strawberry bells, you know what I mean, like the strawberry bells, they're kind of, I don't know what, I just, we call them strawberry bells, but uh, amazing, these little candies would have. This little boy went to a candy shop like that, and every time he'd go, his mom would buy a bunch of stuff at the corner store, and, and, the, and the, getting their supplies for the week, and the owner of the store would say, little boy, would you like a handful of candy? Because mom would spend quite a bit of stuff. He would never take a handful of candy, and the store owner would give him some candy. Week in, week out, week in, week out. Finally, the mother asked him, why do you not take candy when the owner asks you to get a candy? Reach in and grab a handful. He, he gives you permission. The boy replies, because his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> Smart little critter. God will do a better job of blessing you than you would do of blessing you. All your efforts to make sure you provide for you, God provides. He's a great provider. So enough of that. We looked at this in the Old Testament. Some good messages here. Malachi, and I want to jump over now. Grab 1 Corinthians chapter 16. The New Testament church received instructions regarding generous giving from Paul as well. Many people, they dismiss now. This is why I'm starting here. And this is why I had to go here. I almost could have done two sermons, but I want to finish this. We're going to do not too bad for time. Many people say, yeah, but that's Old Testament. That's tithe. We're not living under that. We're not living under the law. We're living under the New Testament. They do that. They miss the fact that Christ did not abolish the law or tithing, but actually, in actual fact, he upped the ante. Christians have received riches from God's grace and are respond generously because they received generously. As Christians, we're to live a life of service, giving ourselves for others, sharing, and being good stewards. Let's read this practical philosophy of giving from Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now regarding your question about money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem. So this is a letter. And he's responding to some, somehow they've made, had a question about, I wonder if they're actually saying, tell us about this gift. Or if they're saying, why do we have to give to what's going on in Jerusalem? I don't know what the question is, but they obviously have a question. Now, regarding your question about money being collected for God's people in Jerusalem, you should follow the same procedure I gave to the churches in Galatia. So now we see it's not just one sp specific isolated, it's more than one church. On the first day of each week, you should put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. When I come, I will write letters of recommendations for the messengers you choose to deliver your gift to Jerusalem. And if it seems appropriate for me to go along, they can travel with me. I'm going to grab some guidelines out of this that is in keeping not only with this, but I believe with the Old Testament. That's why I'm calling it the biblical record or biblical giving. Guideline number one. Biblical giving is not optional, but mandatory. The word here, directed, that has he directed them, or as he directed the church in Galatia, is a very strong word. It's actually a command. It's an order. He is exercising apostolic authority. He's saying, as the pastor, as the apostle, as the one who started and planted, I'm giving you an instruction, the same instruction that I gave your brother, the church in Galatia. And it's almost as if, if you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and 58, the verse just before chapter 16, he says, Be always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain. It's almost as if he's saying, okay, speaking of giving yourself fully to the work of the Lord, I'd like to talk about this gift thing of money. Give yourself fully and you need to also give financially. 
All giving of the believer should be done with pure motives and attitude of worship to God. Generous giving, generosity, needs to mark the Christian. It needs to mark the church. We should not be known as being people who always are asking for money, but people who are generous and giving as a church and as individuals. Each man should be giving as he decides in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul again to the church. Paul talks a lot about giving to Corinthian church. Seems like it's an area where they had to have some growth. They had lots of spiritual gifts, but they had to be encouraged to be obedient in giving. Second, biblical giving starts with meeting the needs of believers. Typically, as I said earlier, pastors, we preach on it. It's because it's a building program or pledges or we're going to buy land. We're going to have something, vision. And, and that's all great. And that's a part of giving and being a part of the family. But that is not where big giving begins. Giving begins by meeting the needs of the kingdom of God and the children of God. They're sending a gift to Jerusalem, a love gift for the kingdom, a collection Galatians 6 and 10 says, As we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. Here's the thing. Those who are wealthy, and may I say, in world standards, we are doing pretty good. Most of us. Those who have, those who have been blessed, have an obligation to help those who are in need. That is a New Testament principle. An Old Testament principle, that's a universal biblical principle. That goes for churches as well. I'll get to that in a few moments. I believe if we've been blessed, we are not to just take what's given, spend it on us. We need to be a part of helping other churches who are in need as well. Biblical giving is the believer's first financial priority. On the first day of every week. Literally means according to one day from Sabbath. Seventh day, Jewish Sabbath. The next day, the believers would also worship. Here's an example in Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and 7. You think I'm preaching long, listen to this. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. (laughs) But hear this. On the first day of the week, we came together. The Sabbath was considered to be the last day, the seventh day he rested. The Sabbath was the last day. The first day they came together of the week, set their week on for worship. And on that day when they came together. So here's Paul saying, on the first day, it's likely the day of worship, the same time in Acts, when they would get together and he would preach. On the first day, I think it's more than just though, come and give on a, on that day of worship. I think giving was a part of the worship, but I also think it means intentionally. Give on the first day of the week. Some don't give at all. Some have good intentions to give, but don't give intentionally. How many know intentional living is different? Some people have good intentions, but don't live intentionally. You may intend to be generous or to give, but if it's not intentional, it won't happen. The problem is, because then what happens is you, you miss a week, or you, you'll be good for two weeks or two months, and then you forget one, or you have a snow day, or you're sick, vacation, go on holidays, miss one, where am I, can't remember, because it's not intentional. I understand there, I get that the same thing as myself. I, if I want to make sure it happens and I don't miss it, i got to be intentional about it. God's word is clear, cover to cover. Give God first. That's in the Old Testament. That's in the New Testament. Give to God first. And give responsibly. Give it the first of every week. Before obligations are met. Before any of the expenses of the week. You might think, oh, but come on. Here, I'll give you an example in Haggai. Here's an example in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you aren't warm. You earn wages, but you only put them in a purse with holes in it. Ooh, does that sound... You ever feel like that sometimes? I feel like I'm working, but it's like going in a purse with holes in it. This is what God says. Give careful thought to your ways. Interesting challenge. Giving should come before bill paying, 
before hobbies, before eating out, before even paying down debt. Honor God from your wealth, Proverbs says, and the first of all your produce. Giving is your autobiography. What you do with money tells you what you value. You can say, I love my family. But if I had your budget and I looked and you spent more money on your hobbies, your time out, because you've got to have your time, and your toys than you did on your family, then you love your toys more than you love your family. What you do with your money is your autobiography. Tells you. Where you spend your money tells us a lot about ourselves. So that's a good thing. When you sit down, you look at your budget, you open it up this week, and I pray you do. You sit down and say, what does this say as an autobiography? What does this say about me? What does this say about my relationship with God? Biblical giving is a responsibility of every believer. Each one of you should set aside. Each one of you. Paul does not excuse the poor, the slaves, the pastors, The large family, the one with three kids in college. He says, each one of you. Every believer is privileged and responsibility. Now, you might think, wow. Well, here's the context for this one as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. In fact, even though Paul says you should not give out of compulsion, he gives a pretty good argument. He talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he talks about the Macedonian church. And I know for time, I don't want to read it, but it really speaks very well. I'm going to leave the verse with you. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. But anyways, it's a poor church. It's, it's not got a lot of money. And Paul's saying, listen, those guys gave, and they're poor. You know they're poor. They have nothing. They have nothing compared to what you have. And they gave. In fact, they sat down, thought about what they could afford to give, and they didn't give that. They gave more than what they could afford to give. And then says, so I just think you guys should give. Paul makes a pretty interesting argument to them. What made the Macedonian gift so generous? Because it came from people that were in poverty. And, and to explain it, I think it would be more important for me to explain a few things. When it says poverty in verse 2, it's a word that means actually extreme destitution. And if that's not enough, Paul adds it, another one, katabathos, which means down to the depths. It means they had extreme poverty to the very nth, to the rock bottom poverty. And out of rock bottom poverty, they gave. And he looks at Corinthians and goes, come on, people. Luke 2, 1 to 4, the widow's might. Some of you have heard this before. Obviously, the Pharisees are there. They give. They make sure everyone sees that they're giving. Hear the sound. So they know how much they've given. And then here's the white middle widow putting what she has left in everything she has. She puts it in there. And God doesn't measure what you give by the amount that you give, he measures by how much you have left over. He says, listen, she's given much more than you. See, the lesson of this one in Luke chapter 21, there's some things you get. Here's what's, here's what's a little bit scary about this is in New Testament giving, we have an example that Jesus was watching what people were giving. Now, that's a little scary. I don't watch what you give. I don't follow along the plate. Let's say, make sure. I don't do that. And I don't know what you're saying. You're sitting here and you're saying to me, wait a minute, preacher, in blue jeans and a tie, are you telling me that Jesus is watching what I'm giving? Yeah, yeah, I am. He, he honored the widow for giving what she gave. She was dishonored by others in her society. He lifted her up and honored her. For her sacrificial giving. Are you telling me preacher that God will. Will honor those people. Who give cheerfully generously. And sacrificially. Yes I am. How that works I don't know. But yes I am. Then he turned. And he shamed and humbled. The ones who were trying to give with pride. Are you telling me. That God humbles those that give less than they should or less than he asks? Yeah. The issue is, I'm not going to tell you what you give. What you're supposed to give, I'm not going to tell you a percentage because I don't believe the New Testament does. But I believe you need to have that conversation with God if you're a believer and a follower of Christ. Because God wants you 
to be able to be someone who's obedient to him. He'll make that clear to you. Believers should set aside, now here's an interesting little, little tidbit. You may not have ever heard this. You probably heard on tithing. You may have even heard a New Testament giving on, uh, message on giving, but you may not have heard this. This jumped out at me first time. Believers should develop a pattern or a habit of giving. Set aside a certain amount at the beginning of each week, right? So it said that each one of you set aside. The Greek word for set aside. The Greek word, you know what it is? Tithos. T-I-T-H-O-S is the root word. Isn't that interesting? Paul, he's writing this letter. He writes a letter, not talking about tithing, not talking about tithing, but when he talks about giving and setting aside a certain amount, he uses a word, tithos. I know you some sense, it's kind of a funny sounding word, it's tithos. T-I-T-H-O-S. I think Paul is writing. He's wanting to bring them to this, this proportionate habit of giving to God at the beginning because he's the owner of all things, but he doesn't want them to lock them into the law of the Old Testament. He doesn't want people to think, that's it, I just got to give 10%, I'm good, I'm in. He doesn't want to get into that. He wants to have it more organic. He doesn't want to have it fixed to just meeting a law and out of, out of obligation giving. So he stays away from the actual word tithe but instead, he connects it a little bit by when he says setting aside, tithos. Have a habit or, or repeated ritual of giving, though. Set a pattern. Be intentional. Our children, small, from a very early age, we teach them how to give, to make sure they give. They get a paper route, they give to God because God gave them that paper route. And they even have the same questions that the people of Malachi were having. I'm the one that delivered the papers. Yes, you are. But God, we prayed and asked God for a job. He gave you a job. And so they would, they, they give their tithes. We call it, did you give, you know, we kind of change the words. We don't say devotions. We say, have you had your God time yet? Have you, have you talked to God? That's, have you prayed? Say, have you, have you, did you give to God? What's his? From young, young age, teaching them to do that. My daughter always loves giving. She comes, Dad. I didn't bring something to give. She doesn't have her paper out anymore, so now she still wants to give. I created a habit of giving. Now she doesn't have any income. It's my income that helps her give now. So I give to her, and so she gives it, and she puts in the offering. Times when our kids have given more than they've been expected. We've praised them for it. Children don't have a lot. Why would we wait to teach giving to our children until they had a lot to give. Why would we do that? We wouldn't do that. So why would we wait to give until we have a lot to give? Why would we treat children of God any differently? Don't wait to give. Give now. Out of what you've received. Out of how God has blessed you. To set aside intentionally, I don't want to be practical today. I don't want to be... Um, it's an effort to be practical. That's the best way to say it. If you don't know, there's different ways for you to be uh, intentional in your giving. We have, you can give, typically we give with envelopes. If there's a way that helps you be more intentional, we have also the debit sheet machine at the back. But we do have direct deposits, a way to just to help you to be intentional. And some people find that if I have it there and it comes off of my paycheck, but every week, you know, this time, I know it goes and it helps me. If that helps you, you can talk to the to uh, the office. Some of you, you're organized people. You don't need to be intentional. But some of you need some of those systems to help out. And so they're there for you if you want some help with that. Biblical giving should be proportionate. This is what I think is neat. He doesn't say percentage. He doesn't say 10%. He doesn't say tithe. But he says your giving should be in proportion to how God has blessed you, or one, one uh, translation says, or in proportion with your income, in proportion of what you have earned. It is, it is proportionate. It is percentage. It's connected with what you received. As you have prospered in keeping with your income, the more you've received, the more you give. No. The New Testament does not demand 10%. The Old Testament teaches principle of first fruits, crops, setting it aside in proportion. 
It doesn't say percentage. It doesn't say 10%. Now, you need to have, I believe, a set amount. I think percentage is the best way to do it. You're not tipping God at the end of the week if you've got some left over. You're saying, God, I'm going to give you this much at the beginning of the week in proportion of how you have blessed me and how you will bless me this week. I'm going to give this to you now in the beginning. And if you don't know where to start, I think 10% is a good place to do it. Why? One, if you're not very good at math, 10 is easy. Some of you thinking, yeah, easy for you to say. 10% is not even easy for me to figure out something. But I understand. But 10% you should be able to figure out. And just do it at the beginning. Here's what it is. It's 10%. Now, I'm not telling you to give 10%, but it needs to be a percentage. I encourage you this week when you sit down with your budget, if you haven't done this, I encourage you to do this. Sit down and set aside a certain amount at the beginning of the week in proportion that God has blessed you. I think tithing is one of the great misnomers, actually. I think some people tithe in North America and they could give more. I think tithe, some people give 10%. And if you're giving 10% and God's asking for more, He's going to ask you to reconsider. Guideline seven biblical giving should be motivated by, not motivated by pressure. It's interesting, He says, don't do this. Don't wait to do this until I get there. Do this before I get there. Now, why does he do that? Practically, if Paul waited until he showed up, he could have taken up an offering, and he's the apostle. I mean, he could have got, he could have really put the pressure in. But he doesn't want them to give out of pressure, number one. Number two, in order to get the same amount of gift last minute, he'd have to really turn up the heat to do it. He does not want them giving under pressure. He doesn't want them giving last minute. He wants to give them intentional. And now, here's where I have a little bit of a problem as a pastor. We say we should be giving out of obedience, but we function out of pastors out of crisis. We tell you you should be giving and set aside a certain amount as God has asked you to give, and you do that, but instead of, instead of facilitating that by the way we function, we function to the contrary. We tell you to give out of obedience, and then we turn up the heat and say, you better give another 5,000 or the roof is going to cave in, or you better give another 10,000 or else we're not going to be able to feed our missionaries. And we crank up the heat. The truth of the matter is, if we all sat down as God needed to resource the kingdom of God and what he's doing, and we were obedient to God, we would never have to have a pressure one. It would just, when the need come, we would have what we need. But the truth of the matter is, we don't obey with what God's asked us to do, so we don't have when we have the need, so then we feel the need to put on the pressure. I'll tell you what I will not do. I do not and will not pressure. I don't. And this is not pressure, what I'm doing here today. You don't hear me standing up before the offering and saying, come on, you've got to give, you've got to give, come on, if there's five people here. I will not do it. I won't. Even though I'll have the need, if there's something somewhere, if we've got, I'll let you know what we've done. You've seen the changes to the upper hall. You know that the things are different. We've replaced, I'll, I'll inform you that we've replaced, uh, we've replaced the, the furnace and things we've done and things we have to do. I'll inform you. But I will not pressure you to give. If anything, you'll hear me say this phrase, thank you for your faithful giving. Because of your faithful giving, here's what we've been able to do. I don't know if you've heard that. That's what I'll say. That's what I instruct our staff to say. Why? Because I want to not only call you to obedience and giving, but I want to function in a way that facilitates obedience and giving. I know it's really quiet in here. But it's true. I'm passionate about this. Practically, he says, now, let me get to the last one, and then we're going to close it up, have communion as our close. How am I doing for time? Not bad. I'm getting there. Whew. I shouldn't have worn a sweater today. <laughs> Here's the last one. We talked about all the principles, and these ones have been kind of get related to the giver. Now to the ones that receive the giving. Biblical givers need to expect integrity and accountability from those who receive the collection. Now, you may not have thought you were going to hear this in the message this morning. Where there is money, there is temptation. And where there is money, then... There needs to be accountability. Preachers have preached this text or preach the text in Malachi chapter 3 about windows of heaven falling down on those people, hit the pinata with the tithe. But they don't get to the part of the message that recognizes that Paul said, listen, I'm going to go. And when I get there, you need to collect it and pick two people from among you to go. He does not say, when I get there, 
I'll take the money from you. Take it off your hands. It does not say that. We have some very strict, just finished up, up, uh, updating our policies, very clear guidelines and policies regarding finances that we have here at Faith. In fact, if you want, we have a, I made a, a couple extra copies. Those that faithfully count, record, a system to, to prevent any money going missing in the process from being received to being counted and deposited. So it, so it goes to where it's intended to go. If you're interested, in, I mean, some of you may think about this. If you want to know what is the procedure for offering counting, we have that here for you. If you want to follow, you can. There's a, some of the kiosks or any questions regarding our finances and how they're handled. Happy and transparent to share those with you. We need to protect ourselves. Interesting. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Also the other one I mentioned, the Macedonian church. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Both those times, the emphasis is on plurality of people involved. You get more people involved. It's not just one person handling money. No one should be alone with uncounted money ever at any time. Paul took responsibility and leadership, but he also said, give me a couple people that have integrity that you choose, they'll go. And if it's, a, if it's fitting for me to go with them, I will. But the gift is, he was removing himself from it. He's accountable in handling the collection. And not only that, how it was used. You see a little bit later, verses 5 to 12 of 1 Corinthians 16. The next thing he goes into after this was he starts going through his travel logs. What he's been doing, where he's been going. He also talks about the travel logs of two of his partners in ministry. And basically just being transparent and saying, here's what we're doing with these gifts. Here's what God is doing through your contributions. Balanced approach. You see, he's reaching believers and unbelievers. I won't read it, but we'll move on. Here's my point on this final point and guideline. What's right for the individual is right for the institution. I want to not just call you to obedience with finances, but I want to lead the church that way. I want to lead the church to be a generous church. This church recognizes that this is God's building. This is God's church, and he builds it. He'll provide for it. It's tempting for us as individuals to use what we have on ourselves. It's just as tempting for a church to receive offerings and spend it on themselves. Spend it and build a kingdom rather than building the kingdom. I can tell you this, when I met with your leaders before we came, Pam and I, to be the pastors here, I shared passionately, probably more than anything I shared, was my passion to help churches. I've pastored churches that have struggled. I've pastored churches that had difficulty paying the bills. I've been that pastor. A few weeks ago, we had one, a pastor in our presence. Some of you were here that Sunday. I honored him. Some of you have no idea the challenges those pastors face. Some of the best ways we can encourage those churches and encourage those pastors. I've blessed churches even while we've been here. We've blessed pastors, and we will continue to do so and find new ways to be able to do that. This summer, we'll be going to one of the pastors you've had, Pastor Phil Smith, who's pastoring in Sioux Lookout. We'll be going to encourage and come alongside him to help. I want to build the kingdom, not our kingdom. God will take care of this kingdom as we are obedient with the kingdom. God will richly bless us, bless us so we can be generous on every occasion. So as we close, we're preparing for communion. I'll just share with you as we've finished a budget time, we're operating under the budget now for 2016. We put as a priority the kingdom of God and in your bulletin we changed. You'll notice this about a year ago. You'll have what was given last week, a year to date from the previous, uh, from this place the previous year. But we also have a line in there It says money that's given to mission. That's a priority for us. Using what comes in, not just for what we do here, but being obedient to the kingdom. A little bit, we'll have an annual report. Kind of just shares on, on uh, how the collections have been distributed. I encourage you to read them and celebrate with us. The fact is, we're part of a generous church. I appreciate the generous leadership here at Faith. 
the Western Ontario District is very generous as well. I belong to that fellowship and I'm proud of that. The Pentecost Summers of Canada is, is a very generous and it has been generous long before it had means. It was the Pentecostal way. So, as we close, have a budget meeting with God. Put everything on the table. Set it as a priority to be generous and cheerful in your giving.